Well, thank you very much, and, and I want to say good evening and thank you to all of you. This is a wonderful crowd, and I'm very pleased that uh, you are all here. So I'll start by saying thanks for joining us at the presidential uh, LBJ Presidential Library. Uh, this is, as was just pointed out, a very important conversation. And I also want to, before we start, say thank you to the LBJ Library, to the LBJ Foundation, and to the Future Forum for the role that they all play in, in Austin, in our community, and, and in our country. We're fortunate to have these organizations in Austin uh, adding so much to our civic life and so much opportunity for us in, in our civic life. As has been pointed out, we're here tonight for a very important discussion with some fantastic people. They're national leaders. They're national thinkers on this issue that is of such important to, importance to us. And of course, we gather here tonight on October 22nd. 56 years ago, on October 22nd, 1968, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Gun Control Act into law. Uh, that had been, yeah, that does deserve a round of applause. The Gun Control Act had been the first major gun control measure passed in decades. It banned mail order sales of rifles and shotguns, and it prohibited certain individuals from being able to buy guns. It was a moment that took years to get to, and it was the culmination of one of the darkest periods in our country's history. Of course, in 1963, John F. Kennedy, uh, then president was assassinated as he rode in a motorcade in downtown Dallas, Texas. Five years later, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was gunned down while standing on a balcony outside his second floor hotel room. And only months after that, Dr., only months after Dr. King was killed, Senator Robert F. Kennedy was fatally shot moments after delivering what was his last speech. At the signing of the bill, President Johnson laid out the law's purpose very clearly. It stops murder by mail order. But the law didn't do many of the things the president had wanted. In fact, Time Magazine reported, it may take another act of horror to push really effective gun curbs through Congress. Tonight's conversation on the anniversary of the signing is also at a critical point in our history. The horrific acts have become far too frequent and frankly, more frequent. The lives lost while unfathomable continue and we've become more polarized as a nation. It feels that we're at another moment where we should have action. And I believe there is hope because conversations like this give me hope. With that, I would like to introduce you to you, uh, to you the, not tonight's moderator and our panelists. And I'll start with the panelists. First, let me introduce Amber Goodwin. Amber is the founder of the Community Justice Reform Coalition and is a Travis County Assistant District Attorney. Her leadership has made the, the Justice Coalition one of the nation's leading gun violence prevention organizations, working on policy, education, leadership development, and building resources centered on communities of color. Amber has spent the last 20 years working for advocacy, grassroots, and electoral campaigns. Next, I want to introduce David Hogg. David is the co-founder of March for Our Lives. Born, that, that organization was born out of the tragic school shooting at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. March for Our Lives is a courageous youth-led movement dedicated to promoting civic engagement, education, and direct action by youth to eliminate the epidemic of gun violence. David has become one of the most compelling voices of his generation. His call to get over politics and get something done has led him to work to elect morally just leaders regardless of party affiliation. Next, I'd like to introduce you 
to Kimberly Mata Rubio. Kimberly is the proud mother of Lexi Rubio, who was killed in the Robb Elementary shooting on May 24th, 2022 in Uvalde. Kim turned her grief into action just weeks after losing Lexi, testifying before Congress about the effects of gun violence. Kim has continued to fight for Lexi and for the victims of gun violence everywhere through her advocacy work. During the 88th legislative session, she along with other Uvalde victims' families worked tirelessly in support of HB 2744, which would raise the minimum age to purchase semi-automatic guns from 18 to 21. Amid the grossly partisan divide, the bill did get a hearing in a House committee. And we are joined by a moderator tonight that I'm very excited we have, Alexandra Samuels, who until recently was a senior editor at Texas Monthly Magazine and is now a freelance political journalist and has been covering Texas politics for more than a decade. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an exciting night with a wonderful panel. And I turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Mayor Watson, and apologies. I know some of this might seem repetitive of what he just said, but I wanted to reemphasize that this group of us is here today because 56 years ago, President Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Gun Control Act of 1968 into law. Before we get into the questions for our panelists, I just wanted to give our audience a broad overview of where America was at the time of passage and what the Gun Control Act did. So again, it is America in the 1960s, specifically 1968, and there are growing concerns, not only about guns, but accessibility to them. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated that April. Attorney General and US Senator Robert Kennedy was assassinated in June, and of course, these two murders followed the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963. So Congress decided to take action and it passed the Gun Control Act of 1968, which was the first time in 30 years that the federal government passed a major gun control bill. The law banned interstate and mail order sales of all firearms and ammunition. It also prohibited gun sales to felons, drug addicts, and minors. In addition, it required dealers to keep records on those to whom they sold ammunition, a significant move because gun dealers were subject to virtually no systematic scrutiny up until that time. David, I, I wanna start with you. Can you tell us a bit about the partisanship behind the Gun Control Act? What were politicians across the aisle saying about this law at the time of its passing? Well, I mean, this time was a completely different era, um, obviously, in the United States. Uh, up until this point, the largest piece of gun control legislation that we'd passed in American history uh, prior to this was the National Firearms Act, uh, which was actually passed after uh, a shooting that, like mine, occurred on Valentine's Day, only in, I think it was the 1930s. Um, and when that bill passed, the biggest proponent of it was actually the National Rifle Association. Uh, what that bill did is it helped to uh, reclassify fully automatic weapons and uh, severely restricted the production of them as well. And we see the effects of it today. Um, we saw a completely different time too when that bill passed because it passed, and I know this is hard to believe, but that the National Firearms Act passed unanimously through the Senate, unanimously with 100 votes. Um, or I don't know if it was 100 at the time because Hawaii wasn't a state yet, but it was unanimous. Um, and since then, the NRA has had multiple right-wing coups within it uh, that has brought the organization further and further and further and further away from what it originally stood for, which was gun safety, um, which also applied to the laws that they advocated for. And in the time since, it's obviously become much more of a, uh, an organization that's helping to promote a, a vicious cycle of violence that gun companies profit off of. Uh, as people continue to fear monger when there are calls for reform and they say over and over again that they're, that people like me are coming to take your guns. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm two dimensional. I couldn't take anybody's guns if I wanted to. Um, I'm, unfortunately, I don't look like uh, the mayor's bodyguards. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think what's really important about this time too is the, how 
much the, these firearms played a role in the political destabilization of our country um, with the assassination of so many incredible leaders, um, including ones in the civil rights movement that we also aren't talking about, right? Ones, students that went down to the South to advocate, and also civil rights leaders that were already in the South that we rarely hear the names of, especially black women that were killed in the civil rights movement that are were the backbone of the civil rights movement are still not talked about nearly enough to this day. Um, and in the modern context, it really concerns me because we know the polarization that we have right now on guns. We know the polarization that our society has right now. And the difference is, is that now we've seen the mass production of weapons like the AR-15 and other semi-automatic rifles that are extremely lethal um, and are made for one thing, that, that's, that's killing human beings. Ultimately, that is why they were manufactured in the first place. It was originally based off the M16. Um, and it really keeps me up at night because I think about the threat that they pose to our democracy, that our severely underregulated militia poses to our democracy, when the original intent of it was to help to protect it in the first place, um, to help quash insurrections and not actually spur them, um, for example. Uh, and I think that we need to take a lot of lessons from this time and look back at how the country was slightly more sane back then um, and try to replicate some of that. Yes, you bring up a really interesting point, which was that for much of the 20th century, the NRA had lobbied and co-authored legislation that was similar to modern legislative measures that the association now characterizes as unconstitutional. Um, the and, ones that they wrote. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, but by the 1970s, the NRA came to view attempts to enact gun control laws as threats to the Second Amendment. So Amber, I, I want to talk to you for a bit. How has the gun control movement changed over the last 50 years? Yeah, well, thank you for that. And just thank you guys for all being here. Um, I think one of the first things that I would just say is that the gun control movement has changed by, I think, just the language, right? Like if you talk to any of us who kind of work in this, this space, you probably won't ever hear any of us say gun control because uh, we're not controlling anything. We say gun, gun violence prevention movement because we're trying to prevent gun violence. We're trying to prevent mass shootings. We're trying to prevent everyday shootings. And so um, I also would just be remiss if I didn't say, I think one of the biggest things that um, I try to do whenever I'm speaking about uh, gun violence is just make sure that we um, thank, but also offer up to survivors that are here. Because I know that there's some survivors that are in the room right now. I know there are survivors that are sitting here. I think over the last many years, we've had the survivors have to carry the entire weight of the gun violence prevention or gun control movement. Um, but that's also been changing as well. Um, I also kind of like jokingly say when people ask me to give the history of the gun violence movement, I'm like, I'm going to start in 1865 and then I'm going to bring you to 2024. And I'll do it in five minutes, but I'm kidding. I won't, I won't take you guys back to 1865, but it is an important context of why the NRA was started. Um, and so it, yes, I'll talk about the last 50 years, but there's been a a complete sea change in the way we talk about gun violence because gun violence is this massive issue. When we're talking about gun violence and we're talking about the numbers that we do know because there's so many numbers that we don't know. We're talking about anywhere from 45 to 50,000 people every single year that are humans that are lost um, just in this country. And the lion's share of a lot of those uh, people who are lost is suicides. And a lot of times we don't even talk about suicides, but suicides across the board, if you're looking at um, any you know, stretch of the last uh, 50 years, suicides are on the rise if you're talking about people of color, if you're talking about young people. Um, and then there's this massive amount of people who have been impacted by homicides. And a lot of what David was talking about, if we're talking about going downstream or upstream on violence, and especially how guns are coming into our communities and who actually has access to guns over the last 50 years, um, it's people in low-income neighborhoods. Um, it's people who don't have access to any sort of res other resources. Um, so they're having access to all these different firearms. Um, I got started in this movement. Um, I started working for Giffords organization, an incredible organization that many of us up here work with. Um, but the reason why I've stayed in, one of the reasons I've stayed in this movement over 10 years um, is because of a mass shooting that happened in Charleston. Um, I didn't know anyone who was shot and killed when that Charleston shooting happened in 2015. But what I saw was people who looked like me who were impacted by a shooting and I knew that I needed to do something. Um, and so I think over the last 50 years, people have seen 
um, the language about gun violence, um, the, the, the kind of zeitgeist about what can actually be done around gun violence. I don't think that there were advocacy organizations. We have people from like Texas Gun Sense and other organizations, state-based organizations. Um, state laws were not being changed uh, 50 years ago, but the federal government has played such a significant role and continues to this day to play such a significant role in the work around gun violence prevention. Um, but I, the last thing I would just say is I think that um, in particular over the last 15 years, um, I, went, I graduated from high school in the mid 90s. And so whenever I was in high school, we didn't have shooting drills. We were mostly, I grew up in West Texas. So we were doing like, you know, tornado drills and different things like that. But mass shootings that are happening um, was a lot of the conversation, I would say probably about 15, 10 to 15 years ago. And what we've seen as a gun violence prevention movement is people like Kimberly and David and myself all working together cohesively um, because we've been talking about comprehensive work, comprehensive public safety. We've talked about the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act that was not just about one type of legislation. It was about mass shootings. It was about everyday gun violence that's happening in communities of color. It was about suicide prevention. And so I think what we've seen, especially over the last decade is number one, different jurisdictions. So states, local, county governments all getting involved and having a part to play in preventing gun violence, but also just a massive amount of people who are raising their hand and saying that I have a part in, in uh, making sure that we don't have violence in our communities as well. And when you say a massive amount of people raising their hand, um, are you seeing more women and, and people of colors in particular getting more involved in this movement? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, especially so many incredible moms and there's folks here from Moms Demand Action, but even I would say in all communities. So um, I think in, in uh, communities of color, especially in our cities where people who have just been ravaged by gun violence and people have said, uh, elected officials have said, you know, we'll get to you guys with this everyday kind of urban gun violence later. Uh, but people like us have said, no, we're going to do this actually right now. Um, but those folks like mothers, sisters, cousins have been really carrying a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the work on the gun violence prevention movement, um, but also thinking about these holistic ways that we can think about gun violence, whether or not that's the intersections of the impact of gun violence. So we're talking about suicide prevention, we're talking about domestic violence, or we're talking about gun violence in communities of color, if we're talking about mass violence. There's all these types of violence that are impacted in that 40 to 45,000 every single year. And so um, I think in particular, people of color, when I got started in the gun violence movement, this is why I think one of the reasons David is one of my favorite people, I'm not just saying that because he's sitting right here, but he is, and we became close after uh, after we got to meet um, when he started getting activated, but David and his colleagues immediately knew, hey, I'm talking to all these like young kids of color from across the country who don't have the same access to resources that I do. Um, this is happening every single day in their, in their communities. I've got the camera on me, so I'm gonna talk about what's happening in New York with Erica Ford or all these different places. And so um, I do think that uh, especially women of color, black women um, have been especially on gun violence in communities of color, um, have been doing a lot of the work in, in consultation, of course, with everyone in our communities, but I think it's been unspoken of the, the work of women in the movement. So I wanna, I wanna pivot to where we are now. Um, so as of September 19th, 2024, there have been at least 50 school shootings in the US and that's just this year. So according to an analysis by CNN, 37 were on K through 12 school grounds and 13 were on college campuses. I think that we can agree that regardless of your personal belief on guns, nobody wants gun violence to continue. But it seems much harder to pass gun control legislation now than it was 50 years ago. And that may, because, that may be because guns as an issue have become more politicized over the last few decades. Um, Kimberly, you have experience talking with lawmakers in Texas, a state that is overwhelmingly Republican. What are the areas of common ground on gun control specifically here in Texas? So um, this last Texas legislative session, we only met with two Republicans that were willing to take our meeting, um, Harless and Holland. And those conversations went really well, surprisingly. Um, we shared very intimate parts of our grief, um, birthdays at cemeteries, trying to pick out what your child's gonna wear when they're buried. And they cried with us and they prayed with us, but then they took action. 
And those two individuals voted in favor of House Bill 2744, which has raised the age from 18 to 21 to purchase these weapons. And that's important to me because in Uvalde, the shooter turned 18 less than a week before he committed Rob Elementary. He had made attempts prior to of getting a relative to purchase this weapon, and they, that failed. So he did it legally. He waited, and he did it legally. An 18-year-old does not need to have access to this type of weapon. We're also sorry to say something. I actually do think we're winning this issue. So I, I want folks to know that like, while we are, I'm born and raised in Texas, that like, while sometimes it may seem like every two years when people, we have an incredible advocate here with Representative Vicki Goodwin, like they're fighting for us every single time during the legislature, but we are winning. There is a lot of things to be very, I know we're gonna get to being hopeful about different things, but I just want you guys to know, we had um, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act that would not have gotten passed without both of them and the work that they've been doing. That was in 2022. We have the very first, and that was the first federal legislation in 30 years that it happened, and that happened with a divided Congress. And that took a comprehensive approach to really tackling the root causes of gun violence. And it's it's saving lives every single day because of that legislation. There's ARPA funding, so American Rescue Plan funding that's coming from the federal government. There's state legislation, there's state funding that has happened. Some of it has happened in Texas and some of it has happened in other places. And then there's all this incredible work that's happening on the city level and on the county level as well. And so when, when folks are thinking that we're not winning on this issue, some of it is because we're, all, we're probably all listening to the same maybe podcasts or, or, or watching the same things on the media. But what I would say is that talk to any of us about like how we can push back on that because we have the talking points and the message to actually say that like this is a winning issue. We have folks here that work on community violence intervention, which is a winning bipartisan issue that takes a public health approach to preventing gun violence that has been shown to dramatically reduce homicides in cities and counties across the country. So there are ways to break through. Um, and I think we also just need to make sure that we're being very forceful with it. Like we are right on this issue and that's not a partisan. We are right by saying that we're trying to prevent um, gun violence and that we're trying to save lives. And so um, there, there's a ton of ways to do that, but I do think it's important that we've gotten a lot of traction, especially at the federal and local level too. Yes, and I'm curious, when you guys are talking to legislators, whether it be at the municipal, statewide, um, federal level, what areas, are there areas of agreement that you find across the aisle where you find that you're able to, you know, get success in terms of legislation passed? I, it's, a lot po it's a lot more possible at the state level because in most states we don't have to deal with the filibuster. Um, in, after Parkland, we had a Republican state legislature and we were able to raise the age to 21 to buy a gun, despite what everybody said, which was that it was impossible because we were just a bunch of dumb kids that didn't know what we were talking about. turns out the adults didn't know what they were talking about. <laughs> um, and we also passed a red flag law that can disarm people that are risk themselves and others um, that uh, was even used one time for somebody that threatened to kill my own mom. My mom got a death threat from a supporter of the NRA that said, F with the NRA and you'll be DOA. We talked to local law enforcement and we used the law that we passed after Parkland to disarm the man that threatened to kill my mother. That law has since been used 19,000 times in Florida, just Florida, since the shooting in Parkland to disarm people that are risk themselves or others. What's crazy is right now in Texas, you don't have a law like that. The best that somebody like Amber could do as an assistant, like district attorney, as we were talking about earlier today, is if somebody threatened to shoot up a high school, for example, you can arrest them for making terroristic you know, threats, but you can't remove that firearm. You might be able to get the judge to say, like, you need to turn in your firearm, but there's no way of actually really enforcing that in the first place. They could just lie and sign the affidavit. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, assistant DA. Um, but there is a lot, of, a lot of bipartisanship that is happening at the state level. Um, and surprisingly, it's, it's uh, sometimes Democrats that are in the way in some states, um, like Maine, for example, where they've had a Democratic trifecta in 2019. I was lobbying there for a red flag law. And they were saying, you know what, this type of thing, the gen they didn't say this directly, but the general sense that I got from them was from the legislators when I was meeting with them when I was 19 years old was, you know what happened to you kids in Parkland is terrible, but this type of thing just doesn't happen here in Maine. Right. So we're going to pass, and I told them, do not pass this weak, weak, weak version of a red flag law that they were calling a yellow flag law that was practically impossible to enforce. And they still went ahead and passed that. 
and then they had a mass shooting that easily could have been prevented by a red flag law that killed well over a dozen people in Lewiston, Maine. And uh, that's why I'm doing the work I am now to help elect young people to state legislatures, because this is where the change is possible, um, where it's way more possible for us to change gun laws. And a lot of Republican states have actually implemented some of these red flag laws and done community violence intervention funding as well. Because we can't just attack this from how does somebody get a gun? We also need to attack this from why does somebody feel the need to kill somebody else in the first place? Because frankly, even if they can't get a gun, if it's a knife, that's still a problem, right? And we need to address that from the top down. So if somebody isn't willing to work with me on uh, you know, how to change gun laws, and I experienced this myself when I was in college, because you know, um, contrary to what a lot of older people like Bill Maher, who recently interviewed me, think, um, there are young people that want to go to college and experience different viewpoints and talk to the people who don't agree with them. And I was one of those people. So when I was in college, I joined the shooting club, actually, because I got tired of just talking to people who agreed with me constantly, because I realized that you could either choose to live in a, in a comfortable delusion or in a comfortable and uncomfortable reality where progress is actually possible. And in the middle of this competition, our coach did not coach the team very much. It was an intramural, intramural team. We were um, going against West Point and a bunch of other schools, and thankfully, we lost horribly. Um, but the coach came over to me, and he said uh, he didn't know I was on the team. And he says, mind you, he's like 6'3". It's like a walking refrigerator. <laughs> and he says to me, like, why are you here to take, like, what's your name? I say, David. He says, David, what? And he's holding up my Wikipedia page on his phone. <laughs> and I'm like, David Hogg, mind you, I had a, I had a beard. I, lo I looked like a Republican I, uh, at the time. Um, and uh, he's like, David, what? I'm like, David Hogg. And he says, oh, why are you here? Right? You're here like, take my guns. Mind you, I have a 12-gauge shotgun cracked over my shoulder as I'm having this conversation, right? And I'm like, no, I'm here because I think you probably have some assumptions about me that are not entirely accurate. And, you may, and I may even have some about you that are not entirely accurate. And I know that you may, wanna, you may not want to ban a gun like the AR-15, I would assume. Um, but you probably do agree that we need more mental health funding for the two-thirds of gun deaths that are suicides, right? He's like, yeah, of course. I said, well, great. Now we could either try to debate this or you could help me become a better shot. What do you want to do? And then I went and nailed all the clay pigeons because my dad was an FBI agent and I've been shooting guns since I was in fourth grade. But from that, what that so many interactions like that have taught me is we are not nearly as divided on this as we think we are. Our politicians need us to think that we're divided because they realize that they, they know that if we actually came together and focused on what we could agree on, even if it was small, even if it's just on how do we fund programs that stop somebody from wanting to kill somebody else in the first place, that's still progress because we can still save lives doing that. And that's a lot of the work that we're doing in state legislatures to help fund programs like that, even if we can't raise the age currently, um, even though that needs to happen. You brought up something that's interesting, but also very frustrating, which is um, basically that the strength of opinions favoring restrictions can tend to fade after a mass tragedy including among Democrats. Mm -hmm. So I'm pulling up a poll from the Texas Politics Project, and this is from June 2002, uh, yeah, 2022, and it was fielded weeks after the murders in Uvalde. It found that 21% of registered voters who identified as Democrats said that gun violence was the most important issue facing the state. But by December 2023, that number had decreased. Only 9% of Democrats said gun violence was the biggest problem facing Texas. I wanna open this up to the panel. How do you all deal with the ebb and flow of public opinion, even among Democrats? Honestly, we just stay, we just stay in front of it. I, I refuse to let people forget Uvalde, to let people forget Uvalde and, and Lexi and her story. That's, you know, it was, it'd be easy to say that after the bill failed this last session. Well, I'm I'm done. I'm I'm want to I want out. No, we're already gearing up for this next session. We're coming back. We're not going to let people forget. This will be passed. There is hope. My metaphor for this is that uh, you know when LBJ was president and a lot of the people in the audience were children, um, some of you at least, you didn't go through school shooter drills, but you did go through nuclear bomb drills, right? The difference is now the bomb is going off multiple times a year with these school shooter drills that these kids are going through. It is way more real to them in some senses. Um, these young people are not going to forget that anxiety, right? And part of what we do to deal with that is realizing that 
one, people don't have the luxury, the privilege of being single issue voters anymore because there are so many crises simultaneously that we face. Young people have to worry about dying in a school shooting or in a shooting outside of their school on a daily basis. But uh, they also need to worry about the future of the planet with climate change at the same time and student debt and all these other things. And it doesn't mean they care less about gun violence. It means that they have to care about all of it. And uh, our method of dealing with it is helping to take a lot of those young people and electing them so that they can go on to pass in this case, stronger gun laws and measures to reduce gun violence the same way that your all's generation did for many of you with the passage of the largest arms reduction treaties in human history. And um, that's really what helps to give me hope is the fact that we're going to outlive most of the people in power, thankfully. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's true, though. It, that, that it's, it's, it's dark, but that's really, I mean, LBJ, I, I truly think one of the reasons he became so successful as a president is because he started when he was 28 years old. When you start that young, turns out you know how to get shit done, right? Look at how many pens are on that wall in there, right? Um, there's a reason he's called the master of the Senate, right? I just can't imagine if him and Nancy Pelosi were alive at the same time, <laughs> you know? Um, but that's what gives me hope is we have a generation that is getting involved in running for office. The youngest member of Congress right now, Congressman Maxwell Frost, came from March for Our Lives. I hired him from my freshman dorm room when I was in college. And then he called me up and said, I have to leave because I'm running for Congress. And I said, you know you're 24, right? You can be 25 to be elected. So that's what gives me, what gives me hope. Uh, sticking to Texas for a bit, do you guys think that there is hope for gun control legislation in a lean Republican state like Texas? Or do you believe that this is more of a national issue where Congress can and should override the will of the states? I mean, I'll, I, I think that um, my, my answer to that is I think we need all parts of the government to be involved in this. And I think for such a long time, even whenever I got started working on gun violence, um, most people were saying we need assault weapons bans, and they were only talking to mayors and members of Congress, and that was it. So our state legislators, our, our county officials were all left off the hook. And so I think we need everybody because we also need people, we need checks and balances to all of that. Um, but this is kind of an answer to your earlier question, too, about what gives us hope. But, you know, I sit up here with a whole bunch of unearned privilege that I've never been shot and I've never been, witnessed a shooting before. But I could walk outside right now and that happen. And so I think in terms of, like, can Texas pass gun violence? Like, why do we do this, right? Like, they don't have the luxury of not doing this, right? And so many of us do could, like, I could tap out um, any time, but I think what what I'd eventually love to tell everybody here is that, you know, we have had survivors who have carried this entire movement. We have had people who have been somehow connected, but we need everyone to be a part of this and to feel like there's a role for you to play. You don't have to be an elected official. You don't have to have, you know, witness something, but um, we need everyone and there's a role for everyone to play in preventing gun violence. And so um, all of us, you know, Kim probably could have left um, Uvalde. I could have left Austin. I could have left. I could have left Texas. We probably could have left Texas. But this is the state that I was raised in and that I was born in. And so, if people don't want gun violence prevention, then they can leave. I'm not leaving. And so, I think this is this is our state, right? And people who founded this state, people who worked really, really, our ancestors who built this state for free. Um, are the ones that I feel accountable to. Um, and so I think that that means electing really incredible people. It means making sure that we're taking care of our survivors and ourselves, because um, sometimes we get secondary trauma even from doing this work. Um, and also that we are making sure that we're thinking about the different intricacies of, you know, even working with, I'm really incredibly lucky that I get to work for District Attorney Garza because he's thinking holistically about the criminal legal system and gun violence. And so are so many other elected officials, but how all of us are tangentially a part of this movement. And so I just hope people feel like there's something that they can do to act on it too. Kimberly, I, I want to go back to you. Um, you were the first witness to testify during that committee hearing in April for House Bill 2744, the Raise the Age Act. Um, although it passed the committee, it did not reach the House floor, and a similar bill in the Senate went nowhere. Um, for those of us who were not there in that committee room, can you tell us what it was like being there? Well, 
we waited hours to testify. Hours. Um, we already don't sleep. We hadn't really eaten. And it was traumatic in the sense that it reminded me a lot of waiting on that day. Waiting, <laughs> waiting for news about Lexi. Um, but I remember when it passed out and I just thought, they're hearing us, they're seeing us. That's Lexi's legacy. And is that a piece of legislation that you know that you will continue to fight for in this upcoming legislat legislature in 2025? Absolutely. Um, we are already uh, gearing up. It takes a lot of work working with other organizations, trying to get it, trying to make sure that we go in prepared because there's always the opposition and we want to make sure that we have answers for everything that is brought back to us. And I know obviously you have experienced such a horrible tragedy. If you feel comfortable, what message did you learn through tragedy that maybe we haven't and what message do you try to deliver when you speak about your daughter and the need for more gun control in the state of Texas? It's similar to what, what you just mentioned. Um, I remember sitting where you're sitting. I remember watching news unfold of other mass shootings and being heartbroken and, and, and thinking, I cannot even imagine what those parents are going through. And now I sit here and that's how easy it is. Like you said, I could walk out and this could happen again. And I look at my other children, this could happen again within a year we had a, another fourth grade student bring bullets to my son's classroom. The next year, somebody brought a gun to junior high where my daughter is enrolled and was trying to sell the weapon to another student. Just this past week, we got news that Canipa, which is a school 10 minutes from Uvalde, there was a kill list that was going around. This is constant. It's happening. And it is going to touch all of us eventually if we don't join the movement to end gun violence. And... For all of you, I, I want to ask kind of as a closing question, where do we go from here? Um, so I'd like each of you, if possible, to give your thoughts on what you would like to see happen next, whether that's at the municipal, state, or federal level. And before we get into our audience q and I'm hoping that you can each also tell the audience what specific initiatives and projects you all are working on as it relates to gun control. I mean, what I want to see is the obliteration of the NRA. Gen Z is going to outlive the NRA. I'll tell you that much. Um, and what I want to see, too, is a is comprehensive federal gun reform. I want to see the same process to own a, effectively the same process to own a car as uh, you need to own a gun in the country. Exactly. Great sign. Um, and I think we can do that. It's going to take some changes on the Supreme Court. But if you look back, even at the most conservative of interpretations of the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia was originally intended so that we didn't have a stand, wouldn't have a standing army because they were concerned after fighting off the British about you know a tyrannical government using a, a standing army. And under that notion, here's two things that I would say: well-regulated means well-trained. If you want to own a firearm in the United States of America, you should need the same level of training as somebody in the National Guard. With that, what else is interesting is that if you have that militia so that it, they can be called to the defense of the nation, answer me this. How are you supposed to know who you can call to the defense of the nation if you don't know who has the guns? You need a National Firearms Registry as well. Um, and you need liability insurance. We need to repeal PLACA. And we need to invest way, way, way more into gun violence, gun death research in general. Sepsis kills about the same number of people every year as guns do in the United States. Sepsis gets a billion, over a billion dollars a year from, from the C, for the CDC and NIH from Congress to study it. Gun violence gets 25 million a year. That's it. That is ridiculous. Um, so those are the reforms that I would like to see. Um, and if nothing else, just a federalization of Massachusetts state gun laws. Because if every state had the same gun death rate as Massachusetts, we cut gun deaths by 70% in this country. Sorry, can you tell us a bit about kind of the specific work you're doing with March for Our Lives? Oh, yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. Um, so March for Our Lives continues to mobilize young people around the country. We do different work in judicial 
reform and advocacy. We have students that actually, college students that are interested in going into law school that write uh, amicus briefs for the Supreme Court um, that are storytelling briefs about the young people that have survived instances of gun violence and the impact that these laws have. Um, and I know that the justices read them because I've heard some of the private conversations that they've had at different law schools around the country about the work of March for Our Lives. Um, and we also helped to mobilize. We did another march after Uvalde um, with 400 marches around the country to help keep the pressure on um, these senators and other politicians to make sure that uh, they knew that they couldn't just do nothing and not pay an electoral price. Um, and I think part of the result of that was Uvalde was different. Yeah. Finally, for the first time in 30 years, it, it, we saw federal action on gun violence. Um, it was not nearly as much as I would have liked to have seen, but it's still been a lot. And I think part of the challenge, too, is that we're not going to hear about the shooting that doesn't happen. Well over a thousand people have been pre prevented from purchasing assault rifles because of the passage of that Safer Communities Act um, that previously would not have been uh, because of the expanded background checks process. And then the work that I do, too, with Leaders We Deserve is helping to elect young people front that have gone through the gun safety movement a lot of the time. Um, great example is Bryce Berry in Georgia. 22 years old when he started running for state legislature. Seventh grade algebra teacher. He worked with March for Our Lives. His campaign was managed by the March for Our Lives Georgia State Director, Mina. And uh, he decided to run because one day he was in class and he found out one of his students had literally the night before witnessed his father get shot and killed in front of him. And he asked that student how he was doing that day. And the student said, oh, it's fine. This happens every day. Because that's how normalized it is. And he decided to run, and he's in a safe seat. He won his primary, um, and he, he will be the youngest person ever elected in Georgia state history and the first ever public school teacher elected, uh, active public school teacher elected to the state legislature as well. So that's the work that I'm doing now because I'm helping to build up the movement on the outside to pressure the politicians, and then if the politicians don't do the right thing, we'll, repl we'll replace the politicians. <laughs> so. Um, I think what I'm hopeful for in the future is taking a public health approach to preventing gun violence, and that means that cre that means treating gun violence like the disease that it is and the massive, massive disease that it is in our country. Um, we keep throwing around this word like community violence intervention, but community violence intervention is part. It's, it's tons of different strategies that looks at the people who are highest at risk of either shooting another person or being shot themselves. And we talk about like homicides and mass violence that's happening in our country, less than half of 1% of a city's population drives over 60 to 70% of it. So I'm gonna say that again, less than half of 1% of a city's population drives most of the violence and the gun violence is happening in a city. So that means that there's not thousands and thousands and thousands or hundreds of thousands of people who are committing most of the violence. It's a small number. And so community violence intervention programs, and you guys have one. I think that there's some people, if you're with ATX Peace, can you stand up? I don't think there's some ATX Peace people here, or they were here in the back. So ATX Peace people, give them a round of applause for ATX Peace. Um, to, to David's point, they uh, you probably won't hear about it in the news, but they are literally preventing violence in Austin, not just in a particular zip code and not just in where places where it's just black and brown people. They're keeping all of us safe in these communities because they're running, they are the people who are running towards violence whenever it's happening, working with a whole group of people, including you know law enforcement, other folks as well, but they are working on the front lines of violence. And so if you're here in Austin and Travis County, we need you guys to be a part of this community violence violence intervention ecosystem that the district attorney's office is a part of, that the city is a part of, because we need everyone to be a part of it. The same way that we build ecosystems, ecological systems in, in biology, um, we need that here in Austin, and that's what we've been building over the last five years. And so we need everyone to be a part of that. And so please contact us about that. Um, and then I think just on the the, uh, the comprehensive approaches that we talked about, um, we need continued funding. David mentioned re $25 million in research. We had to fight to be able to get us to be able to research gun violence because it was illegal until a couple of years ago. And so the fact that that's happening, we're catching up from decades and decades and decades of having only institutions, whether it be academic institutions or other independent institutions, being able to research gun violence because our government couldn't do it. Um, so there's an, a ton of different ways that we can support places like the CDC, but other 
places of research because we need to know how we can be more innovative because what works on one block in like East Austin may not work in North Austin or it may not work on the North side. So there's different ways to think about this work. Um, and I also just wanna say not to forget about the, the cycle of gun violence um, and how much of an indicator domestic violence is as we talk about mass violence and we talk about gun violence that's happening in our communities. If there's a gun in the home, um, it doesn't really depend on which city or county you're in, but if there's a gun in the home, a person is, and usually it's a woman, is more is 500 times more likely to die um, just by the mere presence of a gun being in a home if there's a domestic violence situation or interpersonal violence. And so we really have to make sure that when we're talking about things like suicide prevention and domestic violence prevention, that these things that have kind of been like the boogeyman in the room or like the elephant in the room, even in the gun violence prevention movement, that we're researching, we're supporting survivors, but we're supporting these comprehensive approaches that look at why people are picking up the gun in the first place, but also thinking about um, ways to make sure that people feel like they can intervene if there are instances of violence. And so a lot of the work we're working on the district attorney's office is being part of that ecosystem, which we're really proud that has been built with the community, with ATX Peace, with the city and also with the county and then um, community justice um, will continue to uh, uh, um, work state, local and federally to make sure that there are investments on community violence intervention, whether that's legislative, whether or not that's through appropriations. And then we'll be doing the same thing in the, the Texas legislature um, next year as well. For me, immediately is the election of gun sense candidates in November. And this is extremely important because I want to see the continued work of the um, White House Office of Gun Violence Prevention. They're doing a lot of great work. They're trying to treat mass shootings as like natural disasters. So funds are there immediately. That's something that was missing in Uvalde. Any help was from strangers. And that's, that's it, it's important in the immediate, but also continued. What kind of care, what kind of resources in Uvalde? Yes, there's, there's, there's counseling, but one, it's very difficult to bury your soul in a small town like Uvalde, where you're going to see that person at the grocery store. Um, two, if you choose to go outside, um, they're kind of cycled, so you don't continue speaking to the same person. You'll you'll have to reconnect with someone again after that, and it's not something that I've chosen to do because of that. I'm um, also gearing up for the Texas legislation uh, this next session, so working on raise the age. There's so much work to be done and I want to do it all. And then I also have to be very cautious of, of, of the grief. And I think uh, we're just about at time for our audience Q and I think we have about 15 minutes. So if you have a question, if you could raise your hand and we have a handheld mic where we will come and meet you where you are. See, there's. Uh, yeah, you, uh, talked about gun violence, and um, each of you kind of hinted at uh, the threat of gun violence. I wonder if you could talk more about uh, the, the danger of, of just the threat of, of more gun violence. I mean, the, the danger is that we continue this vicious cycle that we're in, where the gun industry has realized that by they're able to use these mass shootings as their marketing campaigns. Ultimately, because what they do is they use organizations like the NRA to fear monger when there are calls for reform by the parents and survivors after these shootings to say, oh, my God, they're coming to take your guns. Come and get your AR-15s now. And then they fly off the shelves. And then as they fly off the shelves, that then leads to more copycat killers, too, that also want to be famous because the media helps to make them famous. They've gotten better in recent years of not saying school shooters' names, but it is still a huge problem. Um, and as that happens, then they repeat that cycle. Simultaneously as that's happening, as there's more violence that's happening and those guns are getting sold, they're also being you know, shipped into Mexico from the United States. 90% of firearms that are recovered by the Mexican military that are used in crimes there come from the United States. And then what does that drive? Immigration. Then the NRA fear mongers around immigration, Fox News, the NRA, the gun industry fear mongers around immigration and says, oh my God, there's a quote unquote Hispanic invasion. Uh, coming to the United States or, a, you know, some other awful xenophobic term. And then they helped to inspire somebody like the shooter in El Paso, Texas, who murdered people specifically because of their Mexican ancestry. And then the media has the audacity to go on and say, oh, this white mass shooter, they're not a white supremacist. They're mentally ill. Hatred is not a mental illness. We know that statistically speaking, people that are mentally ill 
are far more likely to be the victims of gun violence by turning the gun on themselves and they are to be the perpetrator of gun violence. And we need to stop stigmatizing mental health more and more. I've met young people who've said to me when I was out lobbying in, in Maine, I, I was 19, I was meeting with high school students too to talk to them about gun safety and all these other things. And one of them came up to me, I'll never forget it, she was a sophomore and she said, you know, David, I care a lot about mental health in our schools and everything, I think it's super important, but I have to tell you, I'm really worried because I told my guidance counselor that I had anxiety uh, last year, and I was put on a list of potential school shooters. That's the world that we're creating when we stigmatize mental health like that, right? Not to mention the fact that the shooter in Parkland, last I checked, he had three therapists. I don't think having a fourth would have solved it. I think what would have stopped it was him not being able to get an AR-15 at the age of 19 years old, right? Basic common sense. And um, that's what really scares me because it's a positive feedback loop of violence, profits, and then more violence because they need to figure out more ways to sell different ways to sell more guns because they don't just break down over time super easily it's not like an iphone that's dead after like two years it you have to keep figuring out new ways to sell them and scaring people into buying them more and the reason why they're buying them also we got to be clear is because they don't feel safe right there's a reason why people keep buying these guns so we have to address this holistically too and acknowledge why they don't feel safe which is in part the loose gun laws that we have and I think in particular, and I think in communities of color, black and brown communities, the threat is, it, it it's similar, um, but and it's it's also the threat. People are picking up firearms for different reasons, and a lot of it comes down to we talked earlier today about economics. Um, if we can eradicate and get more resources coming into communities, but addressing the root causes of why people are picking up a gun in the first place is extremely important, and so the threat. That even if it's not real, people are walking around, you know, with guns because they think, because they watch TV or because they have whatever knowledge that they have, they've heard something that they need to have a firearm. And then when you take that and you intertwine it with racism or sexism or xenophobia or all these different things, it's almost paralyzing and it's creating trauma. We are gonna if we do if we don't get right with violence prevention, and I'm talking specifically about things like CVI and community violence intervention and these public health approaches to gun violence, we're gonna lose an entire generation of young black and brown, especially men, um, but also little girls as well. And so it's extremely important that we think about like the nuances of like when the, the threat conversation comes up, um, I think people feel threatened because of what they're, they're hearing or what they're understanding. Um, but also I think there's um, an additional layer of people feeling like they need to pick up a gun or they're being threatened um, when you're adding in all these other um, identities that people have as well. Also, I, while we're waiting for the next question, I just had to say that if you need one more point of hope today in your own community, today marked the, year, the two years of hard work by our, your lovely uh, assistant district attorney here, along with incredible people from Violence Interrupters and others and the DA here in Austin, where they were able to take half a million dollars in American Rescue Plan funding and put it into a program for the next two years that is a hospital-based violence intervention program right here in Austin. And it literally just got approved several hours ago, today. So, so thank you to Amber for doing that. And also thank you to Mayor Kirk Watson, who I should have thanked earlier for helping to come up with the idea for this event in the first place when I met him back at the DNC as well. Hi, thank you all so much for, for being here. Um, I remember growing up, we had assemblies about gun violence, and I think uh, Columbine was the main event that we had talked about, and this was kind of in the very early stages of social media. With all the stress and pressure on young folks and the role of social media, what kind of conversations would you have about people in like middle and high school about gun violence? Um, the conversations that I would have are mainly that if you see something, you need to say something. Um, I feel terrible when, when young people ask me this, que this question about like, what can I do in my school to stop the next school shooting? And it's like asking me, what can I do to survive the nuclear bomb? You need your politician to do something. Because um, it doesn't matter how good you duck and cover, it doesn't matter how many metal detectors you have or whatever else, ultimately you need to stop that, that weapon of mass destruction from going off in the first place. But part of what you can do is, um, you know, 
before Parkland, there were people reporting the shooter to the FBI, to local law enforcement and others, and both of those failed epically. Um, but there have been instances since Parkland that have been stopped because people reported it to the law enforcement, and then they were able to use that red flag law to disarm that, you know, that teenager, the, the, that, that person of their firearm, um, so that they weren't able to go out and commit a mass shooting. Um, so that's really the best thing that you can do is if you see somebody threatening to shoot up a high school, you need to report it. Um, and report it to as many people as possible as well. And there's, or go ahead. No, sorry, I was just going to say, and there's also, um, there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer education, especially on social media. Um, my sister, who is a true millennial, I guess I'm on the cusp of not being a millennial. Um, uh, she makes fun of me because I'm like, it's, I'm on the TikTok. She's like, stop calling it that. It is called TikTok. <laughs> I'm still on, fully on Facebook because that's where I am um, and live. Um, but um, there is in some of the CVI folks here and then other people um, do an incredible amount of work. And one thing that I think I remiss was not saying that has been also successful on the local level. And there's a huge push from the Office of Violence Prevention and other folks on safe storage and like getting messages out there about like if you know if you see a gun or different things like that and I think social media can be like ads different things like that can be really helpful and impactful we have folks here that have done an incredible job like Lisa and everybody um, who's working here in Austin on using different ads whether it's buses things like that but I do think that we have to meet young people um, where they're already at and also a lot of the work that we've done especially in communities of color is on having other peers talk to them about the dangers of violence because um, they'll listen more than they will listen to someone like myself. Thank you all so much for being here. Amber, you mentioned earlier um, the statistic about domestic violence and how a gun in the home of, of right, as someone who is experiencing domestic violence drastically increases the chances that um, the violence will be lethal. And um, I think we could also, you referenced this as well, we don't, we have a hard time addressing domestic violence. Uh, and so when we look at that link between the lethality rate, one, we should want people to not be beaten in their homes regardless, right? We should want people not to be victims, but, um, what, and I would love to hear folks speak on this, if there is kind of emerging progressive legislation around, because um, I know Austin has its pilot program to better connect um, on removing guns from the home, but, but is there hope and progress at that intersectionality that y'all can speak to? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, Kim, you're um, referencing like Firearm Technical Assistance Program, yeah. which is a program that's here that Kim helped us with at the county that um, helps. It's a national program that's funded by um, uh, the uh, DOJ that's helping to put together a city and countywide protocol um, that would say, here is how you remove a gun when someone has a domestic violence incident or someone is under a protective order. Um, so it's actually putting that process together. There is... Um, you know, other counties and other cities like King County and Seattle has been really successful in putting these protocols together. So it's really promising that not only do we get funding for it, but also people from the city and county are all sitting around the table, whether it's judges, uh, people at the city, the Office of Violence Prevention, or people at the county, the Sheriff's Department, the APD, we're all there together trying to make sure that we're figuring out from the point of arrest to where someone is fully adjudicated or found not guilty, that we're understanding where the firearm is in that situation. Um, I also do know that... Um, you know, somewhat here locally, but then across the country, there's a lot of folks who are thinking about the intersection of community violence intervention and interpersonal violence um, and looking at a lot of the, um, the risk factors and the successes of CVI and putting that into domestic violence. And so I know there was a couple of uh, places in North Carolina and New York City, and I believe in uh, Michigan as well, where they're piloting um, domestic violence programs that has violence interrupters, like some of the folks that are here today that like go out towards um, danger. This is mostly when it's happening with community violence, or as we used to say, gang violence. That's what normally uh, CVI is, is targeting. And domestic violence, they're looking at this something similar that would actually be able to use a lot of those, um, you know, a behavioral uh, and, and uh, trauma-informed ways and going in and doing that for interpersonal violence in a home. So still promising, we're hopeful about it, and there's some funding and there's some really incredible researchers that are looking into it. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're doing it in a way that doesn't lead to any more retaliation than we see on a day-to-day -day for interpersonal violence. Hi, another question for you, Ever. It seems like in the past there was some reluctance among, after there was a tragedy involving a child, 
getting access to a gun and shooting, hurting themselves or hurting somebody else. There hasn't been a lot of uh, legal action against the adult who owned or was, was responsible for that gun. But in the past, very recent past, we've seen a shift in that. I was wondering if you might be able to speak about how, as a as a, a prosecutor, you see that as a potential for for uh, persuading gun owners to be more responsible in actually locking up their weapons? Um, I don't know if I can speak on it for Travis County. Um, I will ask my boss to speak on it later, uh, the, the elected district attorney, but I do know that there has been, um, I don't want to see successes because we think of the whole criminal legal system as we want to keep people out of the criminal legal system here in Travis County, but there have been instances um, very recently, I believe is in Ohio, where there was um, you know, a criminal act against uh, a, a parent. Um, and so I think that there's maybe other places where there is a lot of either district or county attorney's offices that are really looking into, um, into you know, seeing what actors, whether it's parents or whether it's um, family members, um, had some sort of role to play. But um, uh, I'm not sure exactly here in Travis County. Um, my name is Max Snodderly, and I'm a founding member of an organization called Gun Free UT, which some of you may recognize. This campus was the site of one of the worst mass shootings. And then 50 years later, we had imposed upon us campus carry so that guns were allowed on campus. And we lost a very intense effort to keep that from happening. So we spent a lot of time thinking about what are the cultural contexts that make the, the difficulty of dealing with guns so great. And they have been alluded to here, but you haven't offered any solutions. And so I'd like to take it in that direction. We, um, we actually had um, a resolution uh, that passed faculty council that the university, and I quote, should mount an initiative to study gun violence and non-lethal means of enhancing personal safety, both on campus and off campus. And there are networks of telephone notifications, for example, that have been used to give people a sense, more of a sense of safety, some alternative to the feeling that I've got to have a gun. Number two is a distrust of government and the fact that we have lying as a sort of standard procedure that somehow we have to look at the bigger cultural context. And I know it's important to fight the battles about every bill, but why is it that we have a public that's willing to tolerate this level of guns? And we have to deal with that too. Well, I, th I think the reason comes down to the filibuster. The biggest obstacle to us changing any of these gun laws in America, far more than the NRA or anything else, is the filibuster, period. Uh, it, I, I will tell you right now, if Democrats are going to say, uh, you know, well, we just need 60 votes in the Senate and then we'll act on guns. That's a lie. They've had a filibuster-proof majority before. Nothing happened on guns. Because I'll tell you what will happen, whoever the future majority leader is in that theoretical situation where we have 60 votes, God willing, uh, it's going to say, you know what, these senators from North Dakota, we can't risk losing their position, so we can't do anything on guns right now. That, that I guarantee you 1,000% that will be what will happen. If we do not abolish the filibuster, we are never going to get comprehensive gun reform in the United States. Flat out. That is our biggest obstacle. And the reason why these polls consistently, people say to me all the time, the polls say that you know, the vast majority of Americans support stronger gun laws. And that's true. Part of what we didn't talk about in this conversation was the massive uh, geographic shift that the United States has had since 1968, where so many more people have moved to cities in that time. And it's changed the, the balance of the Senate a lot as a result of that, because a lot of people are now massively overrepresented in the Senate, and a lot of them are massively underrepresented in the Senate. And until we address the filibuster, it's going to be much, much harder for us to address that. And then in regards to what's happening with the, the campus carry stuff, 
I think we need to think about getting creative and talking about, well, if your campus is going to have campus carry, you can say goodbye to your federal funding and any financial aid that students could potentially get here if your campus has that and see a massive drop in admissions because you're, we, the federal government, the DOE is not going to allow students to be in danger in their classrooms, potentially. I'm not a lawyer, so who knows if that's even possible. But not look at it. Don't look at yeah. it. I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, we, we do need to be looking at that and taking notes out of, you know, for example, what, uh, what happened with the drinking age, for example, with what Reagan did with uh, highway funding. I'm getting really creative about this. I also think I'm culturally, and I'll just be like very point blank on this coming as a black woman. Um, I also think in our communities, so when I said that 40, 40 to 45,000 people, 40 to 45,000 people who are shot and killed every day, there's about 12 to 14,000 every single year that are homicides. And out of that 12 to 14,000 black people were about 13% of the population. But out of the 12 to 14,000 people who are shot and killed in homicides, 70, around 70% of them are men and men of color and usually black men or black people that are killed by homicides. So many times domestic violence is the last and final act. It, homicide is the last and final act of domestic violence. Um, so I know what I struggled with and whenever I got started in gun violence um, was that we were not humanized and it was just like, okay, there's a black person that shot another black person. Just keep it moving and we'll talk about it whenever we talk about incarcerating whoever did that. So I think we have had a change in the zeitgeist about like, you know, the value of human life, but I don't know if, if we're there still um, of that every life is precious when it comes to like whether or not someone was shot and killed. And um, I think that I testified in front of Congress in 2019 and in 2019, this is after the Parkland shooting, it was the first time in the history of Congress that they had ever had a House hearing, ever, House or Senate hearing, but any time, ever had a House hearing on gun violence in communities of color, and it was 2019. Um, and so that wasn't something that I was, I was, I was, I was glad to be there, but the first, one of the first things I said to the members of Congress um, was to shame on them. Um, we, you've known what's happening in our communities. You don't have to live in a city. You don't have to live by city hall to see the, the way that gun violence has ravaged our communities and how we have not had the resources and not had the evidence um, and not had the ability to get our way out of it because we didn't start it in the first place. Um, and so I think we've seen a change because there have been so many people on all sides of the aisle who are now saying it's in the vernacular to say things like CVI and um, community violence intervention and public health approaches. We did have to fight people on saying public health approaches, which is wild, um, because people were like, we don't want public health. And we we're like, then what do you want? Like, what do you want? If you don't, what's the opposite of public health that you, you want us to talk about? But we, we're getting there with like people being able to say public health, but like even having people say, we want to take a public health. We saw what happened with COVID. We saw even if you did not have COVID, you didn't want to be around people who had COVID because it would could potentially impact you. And so we saw how that impacted people. And so we're like, take the same thing you guys thought during COVID and just because you were not shot does not mean that you were not impacted or traumatized by violence and take that into account of why we need to have these resources. We need to have, we have evidence now that shows that these programs work and they need to be invested in. But I think humanizing all of the all of the different aspects of this, especially for communities of color, has been very challenging um, just to make sure that people can truly understand the complexity of um, you know, race uh, and gender in, in this country. Do you think it would matter if there were mandatory uh, compensation for taking a bus that would direct resources? Uh, that's why we need to repeal FLACA. Well, yeah, direct resources would be, for victims of, of gun violence would be incredible. I think that's what you'll hear probably. I haven't had it, but we've we've worked with so many different people of like even the, the challenges with like VOCA, which is supposed to go to victims of gun violence. A lot of times people will be like, well, if you have any sort of criminal history, if you've ever been had been system impacted, then you can't get this um, this funding. And so I think direct funding for victims. But I would just say that like the, the real tough part about gun violence is we we want to focus on what we can do to help victims and survivors. But we also want to the hard the hard stuff is the intervening before it happens, right? Is like figuring out how, why are we, how are we gonna intervene and make sure that someone doesn't even think about picking up that gun in the first place? And then how are we gonna prevent set the next mass shooting? And how are we gonna prevent somebody from picking up a gun and shooting their partner? So the intervention and the prevention piece are just as key as like figuring out like, what do we do when this has happened? Because it does happen. Um, and so I think we need to think about all those pieces together. 
stand on that. That's serious question, yeah. but we do invite you to continue the conversation during the reception immediately following in the adjacent room. So we'll have one more question and then we'll wrap it up and I invite you to the reception. As we go to that other question, I just have to say one thing that we didn't, that we almost never talk about in this is the number of shootings that happen that don't make it on the news that also like, even if somebody is, isn't, even if somebody is shot like down the block from me, I live in DC, there was a shooting literally about a, a month and a half ago with an AR-15 at 2 a.m. It woke my girlfriend up in the middle of the night, a block down from me, and somebody was shot and it didn't even make it on the news. There's a, and there's a street sign from last year, a block uh, north of me, where there's still a bullet hole from a nine millimeter from a drive-by shooting. That didn't make it in the news either. There's so many of these shootings every day that traumatize people that don't even make it in the news, that you don't even hear about because the threshold is so much higher now because it's happening that often. With it, so it's not making the news, but then also the solutions of what could have stopped that gun violence or what could have stopped that bullet, the person from picking right. up the violence, especially in communities of color, especially in, in DC, is not making the news. So they're just saying, oh, if it does make the news, it's just a, ran it's just a random shooting or somebody was shot. Um, and there isn't the the uh, the policy solution. So that's another thing I think we all are working on is making sure that when that does happen, that we are providing solutions um, that people can actually prevent the next shooting from happening. Because what happens a lot of the time is there's retaliation afterwards. And that's exactly what happened. Literally a, um, a week ago, a block from my house in the same vicinity of where that drive-by shooting, somebody was literally shot and killed right there in broad daylight probably because it was retaliation between the same people. Hi, so my name is Camila. I am Mexican-American. I grew up in both countries. I grew up in Mexico and I grew up in here. And I went to school in both countries. And even where I lived, the cartel was very prominent, but I never feared for my life. I went to school, I felt perfectly fine, but then I moved here and I found myself fearing for my life. I moved right around the park lynching, actually. So that's the first movement I started following. And just this year in the high school that I used to be in, there was one active shooter and then like five threats already. So why I, I just, what is the factor of targeting soft targets such as children and schools? Like what, what is the reason why we're finding kids as targets and I don't know because like it's too damn easy to get guns in America yeah. it, it's really as simple as that in other countries you have people you need when it comes to somebody being murdered you need intent and capability you need to have the intent to want to murder somebody and the capability to actually murder them in every country there's people that have the intent to murder other people in very few countries is it like the United States where it is this easy to get a weapon like the AR-15 with a 30 round magazine, typically chambered in 5.56 or um, 308 rounds like it was in Lewiston, Maine, which is kind of rare because it's typically an AR-10 that uses that, but that's getting too technical. But um, in no other country is it nearly as easy to get these firearms because even in countries with stronger gun laws, people say all the time to me, well, David, criminals don't obey gun laws, so like why pass anything? In that case, why have any gun laws at all? But putting that aside, uh, you know how expensive it is in other countries that have stronger gun laws to get an illegal gun? It's on the range of ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars a lot of the time. Laws can be hard to apply, but there's one universal law that applies to everybody: economics. If we reduce the number of guns in the United States and increased the restrictions around them, ultimately it's going to be a lot harder uh, for people like that to get those firearms. Not to mention how easy it is for them to use, just max out their credit cards and get them at the age of 19, too. So. And I think with that, we are out of time, but thank you so much to our panelists. <laughs> Really quickly, wanted to uh, mention a nonprofit I uh, formed with uh, two other moms of Evaldi victims. It's called Lives Robbed. We're also trying to mobilize moms specifically, but also everyone and bring them to the table. Um, it's going to be uh, Tessa's mom, which is Veronica, and Jackie's mom, Gloria. And we're we're really working hard. Please support them. <laughs>